Welcome to another episode of UEN's PDTV. I'm your host, Katie Blunt. In this episode, we will be diving into Education Technology Competency 4B, which focuses on information literacy. In order to demonstrate competency in this area, educators model and instruct students in best practices for information literacy and media fluency. More specifically, how to assess the credibility and usefulness of online resources. In order to accomplish this, educators create a culture of learning that provides opportunities for collaboration, critical thinking, creativity, and communication. This type of environment empowers learners to adapt, create, consume, and connect. Helping students navigate the innumerable resources that are available on the World Wide Web can be daunting. So, for this episode, I've brought in reinforcements. Let me introduce you to Utah State Board of Education Specialists, Robert Austin and Naomi Watkins. Thank you so much for joining us on PDTV. Thanks. Thank you. I have to admit, I'm really glad to have you here because I feel like information literacy and media fluency is a really difficult thing for teachers to teach, so I need your expertise. Why do you think it's such a challenging topic to address in classrooms? Well, misinformation has always existed, but there's so much now with social media and the internet, and so there's just the volume to sort through the, all that information. But then also the climate, like things are very polarized, people you know, are very angry or have very strong beliefs, and so that makes it even more challenging. Absolutely. So considering that climate and everything you mentioned, is it still worth it to dive in and teach this? I think a lot of teachers wonder that themselves, but honestly, it absolutely is worth it. I mean, when we think about really the civic mission of schools is to educate students that can then go out and survive well in the Republic, and these kinds of skills are absolutely essential for that. So let's dive into the skills. <laughs> What are some of the things that a teacher should be doing in the classroom to teach and model information literacy? A big part of it is creating a classroom climate where fact-checking fact and looking for information and looking at sources is really a norm, where it's not weird to say to somebody like, well, where do you, how do you know that? Where did you get that information? I and mean, when it's a norm, it isn't, it's not seen as an attack. So that's one thing. Well, and I think that what I love is that um, Naomi began not with talking about specific skills and strategies, but creating a culture. And I think that we have to remember that having these kinds of difficult conversations, they're, they're difficult conversations for a reason, because they're hard. I mean, this is hard work to kind of look at a different perspective um, and to really question biases and our own biases. And so we first have to create a space where classrooms have a norm where it's okay to question and wonder and work on really evaluating sources together. Um, we often talk about the shift from a teacher as the sage on the stage to the guide by the side. And honestly, when you think about something like fact checking, you really need to move from the fact checkers that used to be journalists to all of us having to have that role. And in the classroom, it means every student has to be a fact checker. Well, and modeling it as a teacher, right? being brave enough to say like, I don't know, let's find that out. Or I had learned this piece of information and the news has changed or the facts have changed. And so I've changed my mind about blank. And really modeling that type of thinking is important to students, right? Because we as adults don't have all this, all the skills either and don't know all the information because there's so much out there. Right, and we fall for it. I mean, the algorithms are built for us to fall for that misinformation. So the more that we can, we can model that, uh, the better for kids. Oh, I love that. And I, I, a couple things really stuck out. The moving from the teacher knows everything and is up there, you know, distilling information and being okay with saying I don't know. I also love that sentence frame of that you mentioned. I used to think this, but now I've changed my mind. I think this. Super helpful. <laughs> So when we dig in then with students, I know we used to kind of go through like a checklist of this website that we're looking at is, um, 
you know, trustworthy because it has a .org on it. But things have changed a little, haven't they? What are some of the skills that students need to develop once this culture is built? So yeah, we used a checklist and it was, you know, good teaching practice. But now we find like, I never sit down and like go to a website and like check things off as I read it, right? And we wanna make the reading and the um, research that students do to be authentic. And so there's a strategy called lateral reading where you literally are opening up tabs and reading laterally as opposed to just like starting at the top of a website and reading all the way down. And those of us who were used to reading a newspaper or a book, that's the way that we were taught to read. But really opening tabs and starting to check the information to verify what you're seeing um, is a really great strategy. So speaking of lateral reading, is there a teacher who's doing this really well and setting an example in that skill and that strategy? Yeah, so Charlotte Ducos in Alpine School District uses lateral reading with her students and has a lot of great success. And so we're gonna take a look at what she's doing in her classroom. So information does not just appear, even if it's automated or driven by an algorithm. Common sense is important, but it will it always get you there? No. no. There's got to be some other ways to do it. You, you mentioned something. What did you say? Yeah, so you want to start validating the source. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about today. How do you go about validating a source? So we're going to talk today um, about some skills that will help you assess the, the sources that you're looking at and the information that you're seeing so that you can figure out um, or at least come to a good approximation as to whether or not you should trust what you're reading. What is lateral reading? Somebody help me out. Yeah. So it's basically where you like, uh, where you have multiple tabs of like different articles and like, and like you'll like read through like all of them and then, and then kind of like, like see what like they say, does, it, does this article stand out from the others? Does it have like this information? Uh, is there something in common? Like, like that. Okay, but didn't that just increase my work like by 10? The answer to that is often no. I might not have to read through a whole other article. I might just be looking for a, a single piece of information. For example, if I'm looking at an article, I can look at who wrote it. And maybe I don't know who that is, but I can go to another website to find out. And it really won't take me very long to actually just read that little piece that says who so-and-so is and maybe who they work for and things like that. So it's not necessarily reading 10 more articles, it's getting little bits and pieces about organizations and authors and maybe the reasons why they write what they write. He modeled lateral reading for you on that organization called ALEC, which in the beginning looked like a really legitimate organization and actually for what they try to do, they still consider themselves to be a very legitimate organization. But when you get down under it, you can see that there's some bias in there. That some of the companies who would be affected by the legislation that they were creating were helping create the legislation. Can you see how there's a conflict there? Okay, and knowing that and understanding that helps you make better decisions about whether or not to trust that information. So like I said at the beginning, it feels like I'm giving you more work to do, but what I'm actually doing is helping you have the key to finding correct information. I love the lateral reading piece because it's like giving kids a cheat code to really kind of unravel and, and make sense of media sources and make sure that they're reliable. Are there other skills that students should be learning and practicing in the classroom? There are definitely other skills. There, there, there's a huge need to just model the kinds of civil dialogue that students just don't see enough of. The other piece is really working to build transparency so that parents are also in on the picture and they can trust uh, that educators are, have the best interest of kids at heart. Um, there's a great teacher in Jordan District who I've seen, William Shields, who works with his students to create that culture in the classroom to really grow uh, a skill set of engaging in difficult conversations. But it's all grounded in the work around the Constitution. It's pretty, it's pretty awesome. And I think parents see that, they see that firsthand, and they know that he's got the best interest of kids at heart. If the Supreme Court has the power to declare laws null and void, should this have actually been clearly stated in the Constitution rather than implied? I don't know. All right, 
Go for it. The power to declare laws null and void is where the Supreme Court decides whether or not the law is unconstitutional or not. And if it is declared null and void, it's pretty much a dead law. Um, and it cannot be enforced. Um, the legislative branch has no powers to declare <coughs> laws null and void, but it can change existing laws to match the Constitution. Um, and the executive branch does not have the power to declare laws null and void, but it can veto laws while the laws are still in the process of becoming a law. So before we jump to Josie, I'm going to ask you the question of do you personally feel, based upon your research, that the founders should have been more specific within Article 3, or are you okay that Marbury versus Madison established judicial review? Because it sounded like almost unanimously you all believed that it was okay that it went the Marbury versus Madison route. What would you say to someone that, it made, that would say that it made the Supreme Court too powerful or the most powerful of the three branches? I feel like it's good that they're more powerful because then they can't get swayed by any of the other branches. So that's actually like, tying into one of your yeah, other judge questions. It's like good that um, they're able to decide mm -hmm. something because the lawmakers and the president can't like, like sway the vote and stuff. That's a very powerful argument, yeah. What do you think? I know that this isn't one from your, your questions, but it's like it's one of those that ties almost three of your questions together. What would you say to someone if they were to say that the Supreme Court became the most powerful branch in opposition to Marbury? You know what I mean? What would you say? Um, I would say there's like, who else would serve the purpose of checking on the other branches? The one thing that I'm going to continue um, to emphasize, something that really made your, your bo all of yours, both of your units, have very opinionated questions. And so the one thing is you identify what your perspective, your take on the answer is. So are the checks on judicial review effective? What is the most important due process you know, protection? And then defend it with facts, right? If you're going to, if you're going to share your, your um, perspective, which is awesome, that's what it's asking you for. You guys have a lot of amazing um, backup. Is there anything else that you all want to specifically mention as far as how to build culture or other things we can do with our still students? Yeah, I, I would say that one of the challenges also is leaning in at this moment takes some moral courage on the part of educators and principals to really understand that we live in, I think, a really unprecedented moment in history where we have so much intentional misinformation coming at us in so many different forms that the technology has kind of outstripped our ability to deal with it. And education has got to step up. We have got to step into this void as educators and help students really navigate this new landscape. There are also some issues that seem open for conversation, and they're not. There are some topics that are just closed for conversation. For example, we don't discuss the relative merits of horrific events in history, like the Holocaust, for example. It's a closed topic. We have to help students understand the, the evidence, the preponderance of evidence around some of the uh, events in history so that students don't fall into that kind of rabbit hole conspiracy theory thinking that begins to kind of unravel their sense of what's real and what's not. There are objective events that have occurred in history. Students need to understand that. And then they can understand how to have conversations about the history that is still unfolding in their lives. And I would add too that please utilize the library media specialist. The library media standards are all about information literacy and librarians have been taught how to do this really, really well and they are great partners. They know, you know, they're up to date on the latest technology, about the latest fads, things like that that are happening that an educator in a classroom may not be as well equipped. And um, so please utilize the librarian. They are great partners. Thank we you library. so much. I love it. We love we librarians. Love library. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and these thoughts and ideas with us today. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks. 
You've now seen EdTech Competency 4B in action and heard expert advice about this topic. So let's dive into how you can apply this information in your own classroom. First, build up your own information literacy skills. Think critically about the information you receive from online news and social media platforms. Recognize your own emotional reaction to this information. Understand the motivation for misinformation and how you can identify it. Next, model best practices. Every teacher at some point is an information literacy teacher. Opportunities to model the concepts we've been learning about in this episode present themselves every day, no matter what grade level or what content you teach. Verbalize your thinking and processes. Make fact-checking the norm in your classroom. Model how you cite your sources of information. Try using the phrase, I know this because... Next, build a safe and reflective classroom community. Develop classroom norms and include student voices when developing those norms. Try practicing structured classroom discussions. Try practicing questioning skills. Make it the norm in your classroom to ask questions like, what are your sources? How do you know? Why do you think that? I used to think this, now I think this. Next, commit to trying at least one information fluency activity or strategy in your classroom and then build from there. Maybe you want to start by talking about open versus closed topics. Maybe you'd like to focus on visible thinking routines like claiming, supporting, and questioning. Maybe you want to work on scouring the internet for information and finding corroboration for facts that you find. Maybe you want to give lateral reading a try. Finally, be sure to partner with your library media specialist they are ready and willing to help you as you teach information literacy in your classroom. For even more resources, strategies, and tools to help you teach information literacy, including Naomi and Robert's full Countering Misinformation presentation, be sure to visit uen.org pdtv and navigate to the teacher toolkit that accompanies this episode. Thank you for watching PDTV. To access more professional development resources or to schedule a training, visit uen.org slash development. We'll see you next time.